His Eminence has joined us at this point. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, your Eminence, if you could uh, offer us uh, uh, greetings and in, in your, in your blessing. Gracious and loving Lord, we give thanks for this evening to come together in fellowship and to enhance our knowledge so that through learning we may serve others and bring them closer to the knowledge of your truth and love. May this endeavor be blessed by you, and may all those who labor for the church be granted wisdom, patience, and strength in this and all ministries, so that all that we do and all that we say may bring glory and honor and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Just a brief remarks. I know we are a little bit late and I apologize again for my being late to you, coming to you. Many, many joyful greetings to all of you. Uh, we have so many people from across the Archdiocese, like Father Nastos, that I first, I have not seen him for so many years, and as well as his beloved wife, and participating in this very innovative and insightful presentation by Dr. Drew Baker. Uh, learning through serving, learning through serving. It sounds like a very, very uh, gospel-oriented uh, statement, and it is. That is what the good Lord uh, showed to us, how to do it. I'm very grateful to Father Christopher uh, Rodellis for making this opportunity a reality, and also to Father Gary Kiriakou for his support and encouragement and mentoring Father Atalas. The concept of project-based learning, in my understanding, is one that can be very useful for many types of ministry, but even more important, it can help us be more effective in what we are offering. Being effective does not mean being professional. Being effective means that you can reach out and be able to look at each other's eyes and be able to be to get the message of Christ in a sincere and honest way. Bringing people together for the programs, educational classes and activities is wonderful. But what is the outcome? Just to create a forum for fellowship. While that is certainly part of the outcome, and we all want to do that, at the end of everything we do, there should be a deeper reason, a measurable outcome and an opportunity for growth. We, the Orthodox people, we're lacking at this. We do things, but the follow-up, it's a little bit difficult. Albert Einstein said once, once you stop learning, you start dying. And this is what we are doing here today. We are trying not to stop learning, because we're not going to die. I hope that this evening seminar is just the beginning of how our parishes can utilize project-based learning to enhance what they are offering, to improve preparations, and to celebrate a greater achievement. It is my hope and my prayer, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord, that this is a beginning to a very beautiful and very fruitful ministry down, the, down the, the line for all of us, a place where we can be able to grow. Thank you so much for turning in, and let us learn together how we're going to do this. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Thank you. And uh, at this point, um, with the blessings of his eminence, we're gonna do just a couple quick introduction for our presenters and one of our facilitators tonight, because I know we have a number of uh, slides and uh, a lot of wonderful content to get through. So introducing our presenter for this program is Dr. Du, uh, Drew, Drew Baker, a K through 12 educator with a love for the, our Orthodox faith and passing it on to younger generations. He currently serves as the uh, educational specialist from professional development in Enrico County Schools and teaches graduate education courses in curriculum design, educational technology, and educational psychology at the University of Richmond. 
And I'll just pause here because Drew's really quiet about where he's from. He doesn't really talk about it very much. Uh, he's from a little town called Richmond, Virginia. You're, it's going to be hard to pry out of man. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I say that in jest because if Drew became the mayor of Richmond, Virginia, this would be my surprise face. Okay, so uh, <laughs> he still is at the university level and researches uh, student engagement strategies, project-based learning, and instructional design. He is a lifelong member of St. Constantine and Helen Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Richmond, Virginia, where he's taught high school religious education for 13 years now, serves as one of the religious education directors there, and he has also spent time in youth ministry working at many Orthodox summer camps and retreats, including Ionian Village, St. Nicholas Ranch, and Camp St. Paul. Uh, so welcome, Drew. And before we turn it over uh, to Dr. Baker uh, and start our work tonight, we also want to introduce uh, Ms. Maria Bartz, who will be helping facilitate our session this evening. She's the daughter of Father Bill Bartz, hold a holds a master's degree in teaching and educational leadership, is the head of student support and academic programming, and has been the classroom teacher herself for 12 years. Maria has years of experience in summer camp ministry, both at Ionian Village and Camp St. Paul. And she also offers her time and talents as a Sunday school, Sunday school director uh, and teacher at St. Constantine and Helen Greek Orthodox Cathedral in RVA, Richmond, Virginia. So welcome Drew and Maria and welcome everybody to uh, what is uh, sure to be a edifying and educational evening. Drew, turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Father Chris. Thank you, Your Eminence. Thanks, Father Gary. Um, we're really, really excited to be here. So um, uh, we're going to jump right in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone. If you look in the chat, uh, if you don't know how to use the chat, by the way, but you know what, let me share my whole screen and I can show you what it looks like. So um, if you look right now, you'll see like my computer screen. Oh, Zoom won't let me do it. But if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you're going on the phone, you'll see some things like there's a mute unmute button, there's a chat button, and there is, um, there'll be, that will also be how we're gonna try to maybe do some breakout rooms in here today too. So you get a chance to work with other people um, and get to meet other religious educators. But so we are working through the Zoom format. If you have any questions, Maria is gonna be on the chat for us. There's just like no other educator I trust more than Maria. We've done like summer camp for three years together. We live right by each other. Um, and uh, and absolutely we co, co now we're co-directors for a religious ed together. So I know you'll be in good hands. Any questions you have, just put in the chat. Um, and she can help you out. And that can be questions with how do I do something, you know, like if we're asking you to respond or also it can be, you know, a, a comment you want to make, please use that chat feature, blow it up. And, and, you know, like if you want to have a running commentary, this is a big group right now. Looks like we're climbing up to like 70. So it's hard to have like the feeling of being all together in the room. So feel free to use that chat feature. All right. So going in, we are talking about learning through serving and, um, I wanted to, uh, we, we, Father Chris gave us such a good uh, introduction that I don't think we really need to do anything else, but this is Maria and I will, will be taking point on this. This is a picture we just got back from Naxos. We made it right before all the fires. Lord have mercy for everything going on. But these are my two sons, Dimitri and George, my wife, Katie. Here's Maria and amazing Santorini. So these are our Greece pictures. Um, but going into what we want to do today. So whenever we teach, right, we want to have learning intention. And this is something that I don't see a lot in religious education, and I wish I saw more in, in K through 12 classrooms, but it's a lot of times students want to learn, but they don't know how to learn, right? They, like a lot of times students are just going from bell to bell or one activity to another. They're not, they're not cognizant of what they're supposed to be learning. If you want to become a better teacher, a better youth director, one of the things you can ask your students in the middle of an activity is, hey, what are you learning right now? And then if you want to be a little bit more, um, even more powerful, what are you learning? Why are you learning this? And how do you know you're learning it? These three things, you will be shocked at first. A lot of times the, the students, even the ones who are really eager to learn, they may not know this. I do this with my graduate students all the time. What are you learning? Why are you learning it? And how do you know you're learning? And this is a research-based strategy, by the way. It can like accelerate learning like three or four times, um, just making learners aware of it. So we're going to make sure we're aware. Um, the thing that we're going to ask is we're going to, um, we just want you to recognize. Recognize doesn't mean like, you know, like we're not going to do a quiz at the end where you have to name them. But recognize means like, oh, okay, you know, we talked about that and I, I'm aware. There's eight elements that you can keep in mind when you're designing project-based learning or really any strong learning experience. 
Um, so that's our first learning intention. The next one is being able to discuss. Um, uh, we will, we're going to give you some examples of some project-based learning activities that we've either done or developed. And you can kind of just discuss like, hey, this would be really good, or I like this part of it, or I couldn't do this with my, the students in my parish, or people in my class, uh, but it'd be really interesting. And then, uh, you know, it's something maybe I could, I, I could pull from. And then finally, we want to um, have you guys be able to create some orthodox learning activities on your own that might work in whatever your context is. If you're a religious educator, if you're a parish priest, if you're a youth director or a youth worker or you're a Goya advisor, anything like that. We will be geared more toward middle and high school, though this certainly works with younger kids. And I've seen project-based learning with as young as kindergarten. Um, it's always important to teach your learners how to be learners in your classroom. Um, when we're training new camp staff, this is like one of the first things that we try to teach them is like teach your kids how to be good campers. Don't assume that they know. Um, so what we will assume, and this is a big group, so don't feel pressure to have your screen on and you can still do in the chat, but if your screen's on, it does allow us to get some facial feedback. And when we go into small groups, if your screen on is on, we'll assume you're ready to talk to other people. And if it's off, we'll assume like, you know, maybe you're doing something else or you're kind of multitasking and, and that's totally fine. Uh, keep your microphone on mute. We've been great with that. Please know that all experience is valuable, whether, you know, we've got some people, Father Chris was saying, that have taught multi-generations of religious education. Uh, we have some people who are parish priests. And then for others, you know, you might have be very new to this. That's okay. All experience is valuable. And one of the things we want to is we don't want to get bogged down in the challenge. Uh, one of my favorite scripture quotes is, all things are possible for one who believes. It's from the book of Mark. Um, we're going to acknowledge these challenges that this is hard. Religious education is hard. It is really hard in 2020, 2021, but we're going to acknowledge that and we're going to embrace it. And like we talked about, we will use the chat. Um, we will be learning kind of through three ways. One will be a facilitator led session. That's like me or Maria or any of us just kind of talking um, with, with slides in the background. We're doing that right now. Um, that's great, but it's also like we could do that with a recorded webinar and I could have just sent it to you and you could watch it on your own. So we will have two modes for interaction. We'd be silly not to embrace the, the ability to collaborate together. So we'll do whole group discuss it, discussion by using the chat feature and small group discussion by using breakout rooms. So we're actually going to test that out really quickly. So we're going to go into the chat. And this is our first question. So I'm doing this and I do this when I teach religious education, by the way. I have like four different acti like kind of ways to teaching. It's like, it might be me up in front of the room asking you questions. This is my expectation for small group. This is my expectation for like, you're working with a partner. And this is my expectation for when you guys are leading the class. And like, just be consistent with those activities. So these are the three activities we'll use today. But I do the same thing when I kick off religious education or I'm working with a group of campers. Um, what are, so I want in the chat, if you guys can answer in about two sentences, what are some of your favorite resources for Orthodox religious education? So go ahead and take a moment and type it in the chat now, and we'll see if everybody knows how to use the chat. Plus, it's a really valuable thing to get started talking about. Stop screen sharing so we can look at this chat. What are some resources you like? Where do you pull from? Uh, Father Chris started us off with a great point on here. Um, Oh my gosh, I love Orthodox ABC, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Father Chris said, we're not trying to replace anything. There are great resources out there. This is just, this is more a teaching modality on how to use resources. Met uh, Metropolis of Denver has some great things. They've done such great work and Deacon Paul Zaharis being out there for so long. Oh, Morning Offering, I love that book. Oh, hey, Christina. Be the B, I was, yeah, absolutely. The Be the B videos on YouTube uh, are fantastic resources. Guys, we're doing great. See, we're using the chat, we're crushing it. Pinterest, that's a great call. Wait, man, I, so I've already learned something today, uh, which is Orthodox Pebbles. I gotta check this out. Orthodox Study Bible. There's some great resources in the back of Orthodox Study Bible. Hey, Dean. Hey, Victoria. Y2AM. Absolutely. The Facebook groups are good. 
shout out to Dean Tegas, our youth director in Richmond, Virginia, uh, and his wife, Victoria. We're so lucky to have them. Um, and what they bring to our kids, BVB. Okay, great. Feel free to check through this. If you're taking notes, you know, on scrap paper, or you can copy and paste this if you're, you know, more technology prone, or if you like just taking down notes, <laughs> this alone may be really useful. It's just getting 70 some Orthodox, you know, religious educators and like, hey, what do you use? Uh, but good, we know how to use the chat. That's awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna go and stick, share my screen, but feel free to keep using the chat and it is okay to use the chat as I'm talking. It is totally okay. That can be a back channel. We have Maria, um, we've got Maria monitoring that live. So we're gonna try small group discussion. And I, you know, it's a little tricky because we're in Zoom and people are coming in and out, but it is really valuable. If we could all be together, this would be the, my, my main learning modality. Um, so for small groups in Zoom, what we're going to do is I'm going to put you guys in groups for uh, of about six to seven people. I like to have roles whenever I put learners in a group. And I actually see that a lot of people kind of um, have trouble with this. Um, I, even professional educators don't always do this, but you'll get much better group work when you have people have defined roles. So if you can, we're going to put you in small groups for about like three or four minutes the purpose in these small groups are for you just to introduce yourself to someone, where are you from and what's your role really regarding like Orthodox youth. Like, you know, you don't need to be like, oh, I'm, you know, an investment banker or, uh, you know, I'm a grandmother. I mean, all those are good, but what's your role working with Orthodox youth? And then in the group, if you want, definitely appoint a facilitator and the facilitator will just kind of remind people what the prompt is. And then here are a couple other roles that I like to have in a group. So we're going to do this in a moment. Um, I do this with my students almost all the time is these are the four roles that I like to have if I put them in a small group. I like to have one student be a facilitator. And I do this with graduate level students who are, you know, in, so I have some students who are in their 60s and their 70s in the graduate level. And then I do this down with like third grade is almost the same roles. Um, a facilitator just makes sure that the group is addressing the question. The coach is there to make sure everyone's being heard. Uh, so the coach's job, like kind of in a small group, is just making sure like if someone's, you know, doesn't have a chance to talk, they're the person who says, oh, you know, Chris, Father Chris, what do you think? Um, the timekeeper is just making sure that like people are aware of the time. And the share uh, is the person who, if we come back to a whole group and I say, hey, did any groups have any, um, you know, any thoughts that they wanted to bring to the whole the whole room, the sharer would be the person who, who would bring that out. So these are four, um, these are four kind of roles that I like to have in group work. And you can even model them to an extent in the small group. Don't feel bad, like, you know, if you don't remember what all of them are. And here we go. Oh, sorry. Put that in there. Need to put to everyone. Everyone in the meeting. Here we go. And then I'm going to paste it in here as well. So we're going to try small groups. We're going to see how it works. We have so many people rolling in. We might not be able to do it as much as we wanted, but let's go ahead and um, we're going to try it here. So I'm going to click on breakout rooms and then I'm going to assign us to rooms of about six to seven participants. When I hit this, it will say that you've been assigned to a breakout room and just click on that link. If you can't do it and you stay in this room with us, that's totally okay too. But if you can, go ahead and go to this small group and we're going to keep these consistent and at least try to have a facilitator remember when you go to these small groups, introduce yourself and talk about where and what is your context for uh, working with Orthodox youth. If you have any questions, hang around or ask us in the chat, but I'm going to open up the rooms and then I'll be able to call you back to the main room in about four minutes, four or five minutes. So you will see now, see people joining. You should see something that'll pop up on your Zoom and it will ask you to join. Oh, y'all are doing sweet. See, Father Gary knew we could do it.
How did you do that so quickly, Drew, with the with the breakout rooms? Did you do it before the meeting started? No, sir. Uh, so what I did was you can just randomly create rooms. And so I did random. I said that I wanted, uh, you know, six people per room and then just hit create. And then as long as I don't reshuffle, it'll use these rooms consistently. So I do this a lot, uh, you know, like when I'm teaching virtually. I'm going to pop into one or two of these and just see how they're doing. This is all, I mean, the man, they, they did, they went right to it. This was great. I'll go next. I'm Elizabeth Seringelis. I'm um, part of Assumption Greek Orthodox Church in Long Beach. I grew up at St. Sophia though. So Father John Backus is my, my priest and all the other ones before him. And we got married there. So Saints is always in my heart. Um, but I am the Sunday school director at um, Long Beach Church. And also I run the Moms and Tots. Hi, my name is Irene Sinopole. I live in Bakersfield, member of St. George Greek Orthodox Church. I am not really involved with children. I'm involved with a Bible study, but I thought this might help. Actually, I have somewhat collected people on the other end of the spectrum that are much older. So I'm looking still project-based learning sounds like a really good idea to put into that. So that's why I'm here. It's a great idea. So I'm Michael Page. Um, I'm a member of the Saints, um, Raphael, Nicholas and Irene in Cumming, Georgia. It's trying time. Yes. Um, how about you, Steph? I actually um, live in Price, Utah, and we have a very small parish. And um, but I grew up in the San Francisco metropolis, and okay. um, and so now I they had no youth anything at our church, mm -hmm. and so I just started um, teaching Sunday school. I'm doing it once a month, um, and there's only like four girls, and three of them are not baptized. So we're working on it. <laughs> What oh, parish, that's, Steph? That's great. Um, it's uh, Assumption Greek Orthodox Church. Uh -huh. Assumption. Um, I came, again, I came into the same thing out here in Palm Desert in uh, California here. Um, there's mm -hmm. a, a 16 kids, but they're from, the, from K through 12, preschool through 12, and they weren't really doing anything but coloring, you know, so to say. And yeah, it's hard. And so right. this, this is just going to be so outstanding because the Pasca, like you said, the Pasca um, Zoom that we had, the whole presentation, and it was just a lifesaver. It was just a lifesaver for us all. Yeah. Athena, um, I think it's important that you share the, the demographic of your parish with the larger group or whoever the sharer is here. I'm the sharer. Yeah. So because uh, uh, Dr. Tibbs, that's important because there's other there's hundreds of other people in the group as well that have that same issue that 16 kids, but they're all different ages, right? Yeah. And so project-based learning really helps with that because uh, you get mentorship in there as well. Yes, oh, I, yeah. I, and that's the difficult part of, you know, having very few teachers, very, you know, the resources are there, but it's like, how do you put it all together with such a, a variety of age groups? Yeah. And we have 30 seconds, so I don't know if Don wants to introduce. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, yes, go ahead. I see Don, but I, I'm yeah. not Don. I'm Claudia, but that's my husband. Oh, okay. and I'm lucky. I am with, uh, I'm coming from RVA with Drew Baker. My daughter had him for two years. She loves him. Um, and I teach sixth grade. I found my niche there. And this I could use. I've heard but, presentations of his students, so my students need this too. Oh, good. And how about you, John? I'm John Strzelecki. Uh I'm the youth director at St. George in uh, Fresno, California, oh. and I'm also in charge of the Sunday school program and some of the all, all other youth stuff. So, sorry, I, I just got back from the gym, so I'm going to keep my video off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. So, thanks, everyone. All right, I guess we'll go back to the main room. Okay. Right. <laughs> See you over there. Also,
I want everyone to be aware of how the energy level changes, even virtually when you do something collaborative, even if it is just introduce yourself. Um, it, it really giving learners a chance, and you can do this in person with just a turn and talk. I mean, you, you'll almost never see any experienced teacher uh, teach without a quick like, yeah, turn to your partner and talk about X. Turn to this, your table and talk about X. Uh, the difference in the really strong ones or the, the really strong ones plan ahead of time what those questions are going to be, right? And like what those purposes are and make your first couple of those just like, you know, getting to know each other um, and allowing learners to connect to one another. And again, we're doing it in the virtual space and you still kind of feel it like got to meet some people, got a chance to, you know, talk about yourself and share your own ideas rather than just information download. So now I'm going to switch. So we've done all three learning modalities, y'all. We're rocking it. Um, so our three learning modalities, remember, we're just kind of like one is going to be kind of direct information, right? We call it direct instruction. Me talking with this up here, new information. The second learning modality is using the chat for whole group discussion. And the third learning modality is using um, the small group. So now we kind of know how to be learners during the session. And also we got a chance to know who's in here. We've demonstrated the small group roles, which is totally something you should take into working with Goyans, working at camp, if you do, or working with your religious ed class. If you do, if you want students to even just have like a scripture conversation, maybe you want them to discuss the gospel reading of the day or the lives of saints or some words from the Holy Desert Fathers, like when they do a small group, say, okay, one of you is going to facilitate the conversation. One of you is going to share out. One of you is going to keep time. And I love this coaching position because uh, especially with like teenagers coming from different high schools or middle schools, the coaches does a really nice job of making sure that people feel welcome. And it's a really cool piece. So talking with this, you know, I've been teaching Sunday school now for 13 years. Mom and dad, can you believe that? Um, 13 years, it's crazy. Um, and when I was teaching Sunday school, and this is kind of how it was when I was there is, you know, we do, we're like a, after the, uh, we do the homily after communion during the liturgy. And so our, we, our mode in Richmond was always, you leave after communion and then during the homily. And if there's a memorial and you get like a 30, 40 minute lesson after, um, after the student, the kids take communion. Maybe my kids would come to church two to three Sundays a month, like when it, you know, if, if they were good. Um, I would teach one shot lessons because like I couldn't string lessons together because I didn't know who's going to show up what days. And I honestly didn't have a lot of evidence that it was successful. I had great relationships with these kids. Like I'm going to one of their weddings on Saturday. I can't wait. Like one of my Sunday school babies is getting married and I cannot wait to see it. But um I started to think as an educator, I was like, man, why aren't I using the best practice that I know works in my day job on Sunday school? Why am I teaching Sunday school with this like kind of outdated way of teaching and learning? Because here's what the faith looks like, right? This is the faith is not this, hey, you show up on Sunday and people kind of talk at you. When orthodoxy is at its beautiful, its most beautiful, it's filled with diakonia, right? It's filled with service. It's filled with doing stuff. Um, and so the difference between how we were teaching kids and then how we wanted them to be as Orthodox Christians was very vast. Uh, and this was in my classroom because Orthodox is, Orthodoxy is about practicing the faith. It is not a static faith. It is very, it's a very dynamic, beautiful faith. I said, well, why don't, you know, there are ways to teach students in a way that is that engaging. So what we're going to talk about is project-based learning. Now, project-based learning is not the end-all and be-all of education, but the, the great thing is, is it's a really quick way to take people who are passionate about their topic and their kids and teach them how to use some strategies that are a lot more what we call high yield. It just means that you can, your learners are going to be more engaged, they're going to enjoy learning more, they're going to retain more, and they're going to get a lot more transferable skills. So when we talk about project-based learning, it doesn't mean just like teaching kids and they do a project at the end, right? With um, the difference between kids doing projects, like, oh yeah, you know, do the science, you know, do, do a history lesson on World War II and at the end make a poster. That's learning through projects. It's fine, but it's not particularly effective. Project-based learning means you learn through a process. Um, it means that the teachers and the students are kind of working together it is often very student directed and uh, it's a lot more real learning. Project-based learning actually, when it's done right, looks more like a really good church committee meeting 
than a kind of traditional sit and get Sunday school classroom where the learners are just sitting there and they're being lectured at by someone who knows the faith more than them. This is much more kind of like a working together to learn by doing. And I've had a lot of success with this with 11th and 12th graders. Again, I still have to lace up my boots every year and recruit and get the kids involved. And some years I have really high interest and some years lower and some years I do it well and some years I don't. But project-based learning is one of the ways that we've had a lot of success and a lot of joy with religious education. See, in a typical school, right, this is the way like uh, a traditional unit will go is the teacher lectures, maybe they do some stuff, you give them a quiz, there's more lecture, activity quiz. But in project-based learning, really what you try to do is hook the students on with something that's like a really powerful, you know, entry point. And then they decide their own work and they do their own research and they're, they're still learning the content that you want them to learn, but they're working up to some sort of big presentation or a reflection or an activity. And we're gonna give you plenty of examples. Here are the eight elements of project-based learning um, that we're gonna go through. But before we do that, I, do, I just wanna explain to you guys, I'll give you an example of the first example of a project-based learning unit. So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with a uh, website. There's a website called Reddit. And Reddit is like a, uh, you know, it's like an online discussion board. It has everything on there. And Stephen Christoforo, Steve, uh, for, uh, Steve Christoforo, who's working with our youth and young adult ministries, had posted a great Reddit thread on Facebook. This was maybe four years ago. And it was about someone who had left the Orthodox Church. And someone was saying they left the Orthodox Church and why they felt like the Orthodox Church wasn't welcoming and, you know, uh, it was someone up in Boston, and they had converted to Orthodoxy and then left. And it was very powerful and very moving. It was like this, you know, maybe four paragraph, five paragraph letter. And so what I did is I brought it into my religious education class because honestly, I just like didn't have a great lesson plan. Like whatever I was doing, you know, that week was just kind of crazy. And I just, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I need a good religious education. Maybe this will hook them. And we brought that letter and my students were so passionate. They wanted to like respond to this person. They wanted to respond to this person who had been saying issues they had with the church. And some of our students saw like validity in some of the things he was saying. And some of them also saw that, you know, he was wrong about some things with the church. So we said, why don't we write it? And so what we did is we organized into groups and my students wrote basically like a two page blog post and our, our priest, Father Nick, our youth director, Dean Tigas helped us kind of vet this and talk to our students. And our students ended up writing this open letter to this person in Reddit. It took us three classes. They did more research than they've ever done on orthodoxy ever. Like I just brought in books and they were like, we need to tell them about the history of the church. And I was like, well, what do you know about the history of church? of the church. And suddenly they're asking me questions rather than me coming in and say, let me teach you about church history. They want to know to achieve a task. And as I was looking around, I was like, this is project-based learning. It had the elements and my students still talk about it. We, we created a blog. We posted this blog. We messaged the person who left the church. He responded back and like thought it was amazing. And then even like um, some of the people at the metropolis level ended up, you know, posting it on their Facebook and some of our students posted it on their social media if they wanted. But it was this really powerful experience. And so it made me think like, ah, I should probably do this more. Like I kind of stumbled into that accidentally. Wow, what would happen if I, if I thought, I went through it a little bit more thoughtfully. So what I'm going to do is walk you through with project-based learning, and this is a way that I've had a lot of experience teaching K through 12, um, mostly 11th and 12th graders through project-based learning. And so these are the eight essential elements. And when I'm teaching my graduate students curriculum design, th these are a lot of things we teach them. What I like about this is it's a really easy checklist for if you're designing, and this could be you're designing a 30 minute religious education activity, or a, what am I gonna do in the month of October? If you have these eight elements in your instruction with kids in the Orthodox faith, it's going to be pretty powerful. So the first one is, and I don't know if we do it. I, I personally, I don't always do a great job with this in religious education. It's been something I've been focusing on for probably the past five years. But like when we're teaching, when I was, a, I was a history teacher, for example, I, I taught world history because I just like wanted to preach the gospel of how great Greece was, you know, to like the non-Greeks. Um, and so uh, when I was teaching world history, right, we have standards. I have curriculum that I have to teach. Well, project-based learning still teaches that curriculum. So you're going to have state, but it's not just standards, you have skills. And I think that's really important for us with religious education. 
Yes, we want kids to know the gospel. Yes, we want them to have a strong relationship with Christ. Yes, we want them to understand the saints and the feast days and church history and, you know, the Holy Fathers and all of that. But we also want them to have skills of being able to, like, talk to people about orthodoxy because, you know, they might need that. What if they are going to, you know, they're dating someone who wants to know more about orthodoxy. Can they communicate that? We want them to be able to participate in the church, to join parish council, to, you know, to help other, to lead dance. So we also need to be the, build those skills. So the first thing with project-based learning is it is based in standards of like the stuff you want to teach, the knowledge and skills. Here's a question that I have for y'all and we can put in the chat. Um, and so let's go to the chat. I, I don't have this plugged in, but I kind of want to just see where we are. In the chat, if you feel comfortable, how do you, um, how do you determine what you're going to teach in a year of religious education or what content you want to teach? Like, let's say for if you're running a summer camp or you're doing a retreat, how do you determine? Do you have curriculum? Like, what do you guys do to determine what should I teach this year? Oh, thanks, Maria. Maria put the prompt. So if you feel comfortable, go ahead and answer in the chat. Oh, Beth, I love yours. Ask the students first day what they want to learn. A year at camp, I build upon a theme skill that's wonderful. I identify learning goals. Old, New Testament, and church history from Don. I love that. Dina's got a curriculum. I see one on here. I have a curriculum that I look at uh, the Orthodox calendar. We do a lot of that as well. We follow the Archdiocesan Religious Education Curriculum. Excellent. Follow the curriculum and interweave. Maria saying um, interweave Bible stories with real life actions taken. That's great. Great, great. So I see a lot of people follow some sort of curriculum. And if you don't, that's okay, right? Um, we actually ended up in, I use a curriculum that we kind of developed maybe my fifth year teaching. And it's like, you know, this, this is, these are the things we're going to teach in high school. And it's kind of aligned with these days it's aligned with the cycle of like because I teach 11th 12th grade so I teach my students twice um, like they loop with me so I kind of have a set of standards excellent following the gospel messages okay that's great so this really helps great job everybody thank you for participating um, so I mean when we're talking about project-based learning I want you to understand that you can still teach the gospel through project-based learning you can still teach your church history if your church history is part of your curriculum or what, whatever elements they are. Like a big thing I, I do is uh, I teach sacramental life. So like some of my content is always going to be there. So project-based learning is based in kind of key knowledge. But, and here's one of the things you really want to do with project-based learning. And again, you can do this even if you want to teach in a traditional manner. This one thing can really help. Um, it's really nice to start off a lesson or a unit of instruction with an engaging question. We call this the challenging problem or question. Um, the more engaging the question is, by the way, the more engaged your students will be over time. Let me give you a few examples of ones that I've used. Here's a great one. You could walk in and have a conversation with them and say, did you know you guys could become saints? And, you know, they'll like either roll their eyes, like, no, -uh, or like, you know, uh, maybe they just don't pay attention to you. But you can start to have a conversation of how do regular people, right, people born on this earth, become ayos, become, become not of this world, become holy. Um, that can be, we call that a driving question in education. Another one, this is one that we just did two years ago, right before COVID, um, which is, I asked our students, I was like, what icons are in our church? I asked them to draw our ikonostasion without looking at anything. And we wanted to see like how close they could get and I asked them, where did our icons come from? Like, who bought them, where they come from, why we choose what we did. Um, and then you can see a couple other examples of this. Um, should we have different Christian denominations? That is, a, that is a driving question you could spend a whole year on. Um, how does orthodoxy look in different countries? I had students get really passionate about this question one year. 
Um, and then this is a really fun one. How do adults in our church practice orthodoxy in their daily lives? This was a series that I did where we asked this question. And for a couple of weeks, I had parishioners come to the class and they shared what, like how they practice orthodoxy and whatever their job was. So like, you know, somebody who's like, oh, I'm a chemist. And when I'm driving to work, I say this prayer. And it was all like really real and relevant. You know, we had teachers who came in and it was like, oh, I have an icon, you know, behind my desk. Um, and sometimes I'll say a prayer when I'm having a really difficult instance with a student or things like that. So you have these driving questions. So yes, you have stuff you want to teach, but then you also have a driving question. I want to go back to the chat just to keep us, you know, moving and you'll see I'm a fast paced teacher. So just like it's, we're going to move like this is how we roll. Um, but, um, what is on here? If you can think of a driving question that maybe would be interesting with your learners, if you can, you don't, you don't have to participate in this. But a driving question, what could be a driving question that would really interest your learners, something that they could focus on for like a week or two, or even like a month of religious education, or it could be the theme for a retreat. What's a driving question you might be able to create that would interest your learners? Oh, Stella, I love this one. What could you do to be like Jesus this week? Yeah, absolutely. That also pulls in a lot of authenticity. Mary, why do we celebrate feast days? That is such a good one. I think a lot of adults probably couldn't answer that right away. Those are really powerful. How and when do I do the sign of the cross? These are great. Why do we use the Old Testament so much? It's awesome. Oh, why do we have icons in our home? Connie, I did this one as a remote lesson. Um, and it's why do we have icons in our home? And then I had friends like send in pictures of their icon corners from like all over the country. But that's such a great driving question. And I love that idea. Yeah, what makes our religion unique, Christina? That's one of my favorites. I, I need to get back to doing more of that. What theme do we remember for each day of the week? Yes, what does being an Orthodox Christian mean to you? Has God deserted us? Gina, that would be such a good topic, especially if a good relationship with kids, right? Because it can seem very like scary at first, but Gina is a professional educator, everyone, by the way, and a camp counselor and amazing youth worker. Do people in public arena practice their faith in open areas? Yeah. How, yes, these are great, y'all. Oh, why do we need confession? That's, that, these are fantastic. Yeah, these are great, everyone. And you can keep typing in here. I'm, I'm going to keep this moving. But I think you actually, what I'm seeing is you guys have a pretty good grasp. Think about putting this on the board. Think about leading with this. I'll tell you one of the best. Um, I just saw a teacher the other day do this in a secular uh, class, but it was great. He was teaching physics. And his, uh, his driving question was, why are there height requirements on roller coasters? And like he was doing this and the kids came in and it was just like a totally different if he was going to say, oh, I'm going to teach you about like physics and angles, they would not have cared. But when he had this, they're like, oh yeah, why is that? And then he was able to talk about like the nece like weight and physics and mass and acceleration. It was, it was just really cool. So when you nail a driving question, it does a lot of the work for you to engage the students. So the third thing that we'll have on here is what we call sustained inquiry. And this is um, where students are really asking questions as they go. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and share. Here's a, a, a project that I had my students do. I'm, I'm going to show you how we did it as we kind of get into later in the presentation. But my students got really into, we we're looking at iconography in our church, like adding iconography. So I was like, well, that's a driving question, right? Like, you know, hey, what icon should we choose and where did our ones come from? Well, when our students really started to research this, we researched for Gosh, Dean and Maria could probably remind me. I feel like we researched for two. Oh yeah, we researched from September to beginning of November of all about, they had to research. And it started off with like, they wanted to just learn about icons. So I got them some books. We watched some videos on YouTube. I had um, our assistant, our, 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 our boy Thar, our assistant priest, Father Bill Bartz came by and Father Bill like talked to them all about icons and it was amazing. And then after that, they had to go, they were like, well, where did our icons come from? So they had to consult, like we have these church history books like that we did for a hundred year anniversary and they're doing their own research and it's sustained. So like they're answering questions. And then as they find, as they answer some questions, they have more questions and you're tracking it. And this is a very different way of learning. Think about it than I like can sit and get, 
right? Where I'm coming in for 30 minutes. I'm like, here's the feast days you need to know. That's like my sassy teacher. But like what instead they were asking their own questions and trying to answer. And it was really cool because as you guys know, it's hard to engage these kids. It's hard to engage kids in a K through 12 environment. It is really hard to engage kids that you see once a week in religious ed. It's just tough, you know, with the traditional model. So this one really helped. The next one kind of moving on to our elements is authenticity. And I think a lot of you guys really hit this and your driving questions were very, very authentic. Um, but to find authenticity, what I like to do is I like to look for like real problems, in this case, maybe in the parish or in the Orthodox world or the community or in the kids' lives and, and speak to that. Authenticity is like, does it really matter to the students? When I'm working with math teachers to be more authentic, the first thing I ask them is like, when do your students actually use these skills? And that's where you need to start. So, uh, for example, I was working with a math teacher and we, he was teaching trigonometry. So for authenticity, we actually had his kids use trigonometry to line a football field without using measurements. Like they could only use triangles. It was awesome. But that was a very authentic task. They were doing something real. Um, one of the coolest uh, pieces of authenticity, this is actually something I want to do this year, is uh, Father Chris Rutellis actually had this great idea where they're doing pew inserts for uh young families. Father Chris, am I cool to talk about this? You got it. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. So he sent me this and I was like, this is very authentic, right? Like he, he's, it's a pew insert for like, Hey, if you're a young family and you bring your kid into church, we welcome you. Like absolutely do not feel bad about having noise in the pews. And it was even a message to the parish about how we, what we can do to support young families and all the resources. Well, he sent me this. And at first I was like, Oh my gosh, we need this in my parish. But then luckily I stopped and I thought, oh, wait a minute, I could do it or I could have my religious education students do it. And then I could use that as a way to teach my curriculum of learning about the liturgy and who comes to the liturgy. So that's an example of an authentic task. And I'll share you guys some more, but that's really important. These other ones that are really tough to get in sometimes are reflection. And this is a lot of times we just move from one lesson to another, right? Like for me, especially when I was first teaching religious ed, it was each lesson was a one shot deal. Like you didn't have to have come to the first five lessons to understand this one. And that still happens. But what I try to do is I try to pull in times where they, people can reflect, uh, where our learners can reflect, where they can look through and think, how did I do in this learning process? You know, what have I, what could I do better? Um, and, and what did I learn? Like stopping to think, what did I learn? A lot of you guys say that you pre-test your kids, which is awesome. Like at the beginning of the year, I ask them what they want to learn. That's incorporating some reflection where they have to think, okay, I've been in religious education for eight years, for 10 years or whatever. What have I learned? But asking them that question, even at the end of every unit, right? Like at the end of every lesson, like, what did you learn today? What did you get out of today? And if, uh, uh, the research behind reflection is really powerful. It creates something called metacognition comes from Greek words, uh, but metacognition means, you know, thinking about your own thinking. And um, it really makes the learning experience powerful and it creates lifelong learners, which is what we want. We want people who can learn lifelong in the faith. And then uh, our final piece right here is taking that, um, or no, this isn't the final one, but this one's really important as well, the second to last, is incorporating voice and choice. We're getting really into this in K-12, thank goodness, but it's letting students make the decision. Um, one of the things I used to tell camp counselors when I trained them is, you know, if, if it doesn't really matter, let the kids make the decision. If, if it is, you know, where, what bunks people sleep in or, you know, what order we walk to when we're going to, you know, to, to go to dinner, let them make the decision because then you can spend kind of your capital on the decisions that really matter. When learners have agency, which is voice and choice, which means like they have choice over what they learn or how they learn or what their job is with learning, not only are they more engaged, but they feel like um, they start to develop the skills to teach themselves. So whenever possible, like find ways to let them choose either what they're learning, but it doesn't have to be just what they're learning, how they learn it. Like this year we did this where I was like, okay, you know, we need to do Zoom meetings. What days do you want to do Zoom meetings? We don't necessarily have to do it on Sunday because we're all at home with COVID. I let my students pick when we met, for example, because it didn't really matter to me. Um, or then they can also choose what is their role in the learning. For example, not everybody wants to 
be a writer, like on, you know, when we were writing the response to that blog post, some students wanted to be the people who wrote, some people who wanted to be the people who did research, letting them choose what jobs they have too makes a really big difference. So in the chat, what I'd like to do is, um, can you guys share an example of a place where you've seen Orthodox youth take charge of their own learning? Andrea, great question. Yeah, they did choose Sunday, but they chose Sunday evening. So we did Sunday evening, like Zoom calls. Um, and I think I got more response from it where we were doing Zoom and because they picked their time. They also picked like, you know, like what it would look like when we came back, which because we were, we were able to come back. I know West Coast, East Coast, there's some differences, but um, they, they actually helped figure out what our classroom would be like. So our question is, have you seen Orthodox youth take charge of their own learning in some way? And if so, share the example in the chat. Maria, thank you for always being one step ahead. And great reminder up here, Father Gary, we will email all these slides to everyone for sure. And then I made it so you can make a copy of these slides, you can use it. If there's information on it, you want it, you can steal it. You don't need to ask my permission for any of it. Use whatever you want. Yes, okay, Elizabeth, I think you bring up one of the best ones, right? High schools teaching the younger kids. Right, that's like one of the, you know, like, it, and they volunteered to do it. <clears throat> Sam and Sophia, I'm so excited you brought up oratorical. And I am Maria smiling because she heads up our oratorical. When oratorical is done well, it is fantastic project-based learning. Um, what, sometimes we have trouble with oratorical, and I'm gonna talk about this more, is because we throw students in and they've never done They've never taken charge of their own learning before. So when that's the very first thing they've ever done, you may have to really encourage them to do it. But if you do more of this building up, oratorical becomes they're used to researching their faith. They're used to talking about it. So a lot of times when you see a thriving oratorical, it's usually because of two things. One, there's somebody amazing in the parish who's like making it happen. And two, um, it's because the parish has found ways to build in experiences leading up to that. So that's not the first time they've ever had to do anything on their own regarding orthodoxy. Yeah, Gina, yes, like when they choose it, this is great. Oh, wow, yeah, picking what book? Um, Victoria, I'm so glad you picked, you said camp on here, because um, that was definitely one of the things. I actually think that camp does a really nice job instructionally, like a lot of the traditional things we do at camp. We typically give kids a lot of power. They pick what skit they're going to do. They pick what saint they want to talk about. And they're so much more engaged like than if we just told them what to do. Youth mentoring younger kids. Yes, Andrea, we call it a reciprocal teaching. It's super, super powerful. This is great, y'all. All right, I'm going to go back in. Great responses here. And so the final, the, um, here's one of the things that I like to do for reflection and voice and choice, by the way, is I'm a big fan of giving surveys. And actually, I need to change how I'm sharing my screen. Sorry, it's going to pop in and out because I clicked the wrong button. Um, Google Forms is a really great way to collect information by email. You can, totally, you can do any of this by paper form, by the way. Um, but one thing I like to do I always try to survey parents, just learning about their kids, what format they like, what do they need as parents, what do their stu students need. This, this one is COVID related, this form, but it's just an example. Another thing that we do in education, and those of you guys that are professional educators, you'll know this you know, very clearly, is an exit ticket. This is a really simple one. Three questions. What's one important thing you learned in class today? What would help make today's lesson more effective? What would you like to learn about next time? For me, I'm actually just gonna, when I teach this year, I'm gonna have this, I'm gonna have them answer this question at the end of every lesson. Um, it's really powerful too, because it gets them thinking about their own thinking and it brings in that reflection. And then finally, you can always do a pre-assessment on here, right? How, how well could you explain the major Orthodox feast days to a friend? If all my kids are saying very well, then maybe I'm gonna do things a little bit differently, right? These forms do not take me long to make. If you're familiar with Google, it's gonna be super easy. If you're not familiar with Google, you can always write these by hand and print them out and bring them in paper copy, or you can have someone else do it. 
for you and send them to your students ahead of time and give you the data. But, you know, don't be afraid to survey your kids. I, I honestly, I think we need to do this for summer camps. Like, I think, you know, there's, why not do a survey for every kid at the end of a summer camp? Like, how was your experience? What did you want to learn about? What was the best moment? Give someone a shout out. Um, and because it's really easy to collect data this way. In schools, we do it all the time. Parents, y'all know this because you're filling out a million surveys from like your kid's school. Um, we need to do this more. We need to know if our instruction is taking and what the kids think. And then also when you fill out a survey, it makes you reflect. So that's, there's some value there. And I like Google Forms because it's really easy, but again, you can, you can totally do it by paper. And then finally, one of the ones I think that's hard, that I have to remind myself to incorporate the most is critique and revision. And I put this down on here. Um, this is really hard. It, it, we know that learners learn through feedback, right? Like think about the best writing, um, like the best writing instructor you ever had, someone who taught you how to write. They probably taught you less about because they're standing up and, you know, telling you how to write and more because you sent in samples of work and they gave you feedback on it and you did it over and over again. This is how we learn a language, right? Like when we're teaching our kids to speak, like our young kids to speak, we don't teach them grammar. They just try to talk all the time and we eventually correct them and we, we teach them how to do it. I don't see this happening a lot in religious education or even in youth work. And it's something I've tried to slowly start to build in. One of the examples is like, this was the letter response to that post that I, that I mentioned earlier. And so when we wrote this letter to our Orthodox generation, and you can go look at this whenever you want, but these are the kids and, and what they wrote to a student who, or to the person who said they left the Orthodox church, we had, um, I had Maria read it because she's an English teacher. And then I had Father Nick and our youth director, Dean Tegas, read it because they had the theological background and they were getting feedback. And this letter ended up being the third or fourth version they wrote. And it was so much more meaningful and they learned so much more because we gave them a chance to not just do work, but also do work and continue to improve upon it. And we don't do that a lot in religious education. It's hard to do. And then the piece that you probably gotten, you know, a sense for what we wanted uh, for like the, the, the final kind of point of, of project-based learning is this idea of a public product. And this is giving learners a chance to show their work to others. And what I love about this is the public product isn't just them presenting in the classroom. The key is getting it outside the classroom and outside of just doing something for you as the teacher. The difference between a student writing an essay for a teacher and the teacher like just been like, yeah, hey, great job. Or a student writing an essay and the essay gets put up somewhere public where other people read it is huge. People who do oratorical well, they, they know this because of the public product, the students have to give a you know three, four, five minute talk. They need to give a speech. So they, that's what we call the public product of work. Um, so the public product is really important because it means that they get out there and um, share what they're doing. So I'm, I'm going to bring us back in a second. Um, but these are the eight elements of project-based learning. I know we went through them pretty quickly. You don't need to have them memorized. What I recommend is when you're planning, um, when you're planning instruction, or like let's say you have a new idea for a religious education lesson or an activity, like let's say you're doing you know a, a retreat, a Lenten retreat. Take these eight elements and think, are these present? Just use it like a checklist. And I'm, I'm telling you, all, I've, I've taught this. I've been teaching this way since 2010. And like, I teach people how to teach this way. And I still pull out this like dumb little circle and check off because I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to give them a chance to do critique and revision, or I don't have a driving question. And if you can keep these eight elements, even in like a short little lesson of like, oh yeah, let me give it a chance to um, give them voice and choice. I need to do that more. It can help you self-correct and take things that you're doing that are already really strong and make them even stronger. You'll also start to see the value of like, oh, that's probably one of the reasons why it's worked. And all of these are based in a ton, a ton of really strong research for like how people learn and retain information. So these are our eight elements of project-based learning. I'm gonna go over them again and actually give you guys a chance to talk in small groups as well. And then what I'll do is I'll share some examples of real projects. 
So our eight things, remember, it all starts with a curriculum or at least the things that you want to teach, whether it's the gospel lesson, whether it is, maybe it's a skill. Maybe you want people to feel more comfortable in prayer. Maybe you want people to feel more comfortable talking about their faith or, or serving others. Um, but it teaches with the stuff you, what do you want to teach? And you're going to make sure it has a challenging problem, sustained inquiry where they're constantly asking questions. It's authentic. They're, they have voice and choice. They're reflecting. There's critique and revision. And finally, it's presented through a public product. And that public product is so critical. Um, it's so important that they actually get their learning and they show it out. And the great thing for us is we have a, an amazingly supportive audience at all times because at any point you can have them present something to the parish or the kids in the parish or their parents or whatever. So we're gonna go into our small groups. I'm gonna break it again. Remember you've got your facilitator, coach, timekeeper and share. And I, uh, this is our question. I'm gonna blast it out to everybody when we do it. But I wanna say which of these eight elements of project-based learning would help the learners with whom you work the most? So which of these was really attractive to you and resonated with you? So we're gonna go into our small groups. And again, I'll, I'll, um, you guys can see when you guys are in there, I'll, I'll blast it out. But just listen to the prompt now. The prompt is which of these eight elements or things that we've been talking about so far really resonate with you and you think would work with whatever learners you're working with. If you're a religious education teacher, if you're a youth worker, whatever. Which of these elements really stuck out to you? Have a chance to, to discuss this with other people. Um, facilitator, just kind of make sure everybody's moving. It's 10.13 right now. Oh, not 10.13. It's like whatever time for y'all on the West Coast. Oh, on the Lord's time is 1014. So we'll be coming back and like, um, I don't know, we'll come back at like 22. Uh, that should give us enough time to talk in the small groups. All right, here are small groups. Open all rooms. And you should hit a thing that says inviting you to join. There we go. Just send everybody a reminder. Yeah, everybody's joined in. This is great. Father, I'm going to work to pretty much keep us on time. Just so you know, I'm not going to like, I won't like extend on here and like go long, but what we can do is I do have on the reflection, I'll, I will go through the five examples. So we might go like a little bit, but I'm going to try to, um, to kind of like stay within the, the timeline we set to everybody. If that's all right with you. No problem. I'm, I'm not good with uh, time zones. I'm, I don't know what time zone I'm in here and there. So I forgot that it was 10 PM for you guys. So yeah, uh, thank you. You're a champ. Um, uh, uh, are you going to give a, a time for question and answers though, right? I will. I will. And so that one, what we can do is like, we can let people hang around. I'll hang around as long as everybody wants, but I just, and, and we'll still, I mean, like I said, I will probably go like a little longer on here because we started like about 
you know, 10, 15 minutes later, which is totally fine. So I'll do that. But I just like, I won't keep this thing going like 30 minutes past or anything like that. And, but I will have Q and A. So if people want to hang around and talk, no problem. Yeah, that's awesome. You're great. Thank you. Uh, yes, the Mitch, Paulton, Mitch Paulton jumped on another Zoom, but he said, great presentation, uh, important presentation. God bless the work you do. So thank you. Oh, that's great. He's wonderful. You guys are stacked in Richmond, man. Yeah, baby. I'm building, <laughs> building dream team. Come on out whenever you Holy want. Man. Yeah. yeah, my family, you know, my family didn't leave, uh, didn't leave the poly to come here and like not have it be awesome. Right. Everybody gave up a lot. You get the Barts, you got the Teguses, you got you. Just been grabbing. Just been grabbing. Come on out. You guys, you, your family's from the Poli? Yep. My my papu was born there. It was born in the Fanati, actually. Really? Uh, had, uh, was he was he a uh, part of the 1922? Uh, I'm reading a book on that right now. Oh, which one? God, I wish I knew. I'm re I, I'm the kind of guy that reads like four books at one time, so I never remember the titles. Um, a stack of a bunch of those that I've been meaning to read of like you know the, the Exodus and the the book uh, the Cursed Day really got me into that type of history and so um, that 1922 I, I read Ships of Mercy several years ago. Oh yeah, I've never read, but I have it. Yeah. This is great. All right, I'm going to pop into one or two and make sure they're doing well. Okay. I like to always give everybody a little breathing room before you pop in. Sometimes it makes people nervous.
Can you see my phone anywhere? Mm -mm. My birthday money has to go to it now. Drew, I'm really oh. impressed by the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, sorry, my group, we were, were having this great conversation and I had, I had the timer set for like a win for us to go back. I was like, oh, caught by my own timer. Uh, so I'm sorry, because we were having a, Sam, Sophia, your eminence, we were having this uh, the Connie, amazing conversation. What a, we had this great group. Stephanie had this really cool lesson idea I'm totally gonna steal. I never thought to transfer it over. And I'm sorry, what were you saying, Father? No, I was just saying, I'm just impressed by the, the caliber of people that are on here. They've just, uh, I mean, there's so many people here that could just share what they do and it would be interesting to hear. I want to hear that idea that you're going to steal as well, because I want to steal it. We will. And, you know, um, when we're working with adult learners, but I think this is also very true with kids, you know, when I'm, one of the things I'll do is I'll teach people how to teach adults. And it's the belief, you have to have the core belief that the room knows more than you no matter what your level of expertise is, when you get a group of people together, I think this really matters for us in the parish too. The group generally knows more than the best expert because you have this combination of like lived experiences. I, I honestly think that's true with kids too because uh, Father Gary, I'm the same way. I'm going into here and like, God, this is high level stuff. And so thank you guys for doing and participating in the small groups because it lets us leverage that. If people go into small groups and don't talk, you know, we don't get to take advantage of your experience, what, whatever it may be. So thank you. So at what age, I, I came in a little later, were you talking about the appropriateness of project base at what level? I mean, we have... Uh, mommy and me Sunday school, you know, for children under three, we have preschool, we have first, second, third. So, so at what point do you have discussions on what would you like to learn today? Or, you know, you know it's a great question, Mary. So I mean, one of the things on here is you've got to, um, you know, it's all developmentally appropriate. So with the younger kids, you can still pull in elements of voice and choice, right? That we're very good with the little, I mean, public product of work, the little kids doing a nativity, like if they're doing a Christmas nativity is a public product of work. Um, you know, imagine if we gave them the chance where you gather them around after doing like a Christmas nativity or a Christmas pageant and be like, hey, everyone, we just did, you know, we just walked through the life of Jesus Let's think about it now that you went through the nativity. What is something now that you learned about Christmas? You could, I mean, I could ask my four and a half year old that. So it's just taking these and and bringing them in um, and bring it down. Oh yes, Father, do we want to? So I saw in the chat, Your Eminence. Thank you so much. His Eminence just said that he had to jump on another Zoom, so I just I gave him my blessing to go. Oh, good. I saw him there. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. oh yeah, we got his prayers. Okay. I hope he's gone and didn't hear that. 
Um, so yes, this is awesome. So what I'm going to do here, and we're kind of, we got sort of a little bit late. So what I'm going to do is just like flex up that time. I'm, I'm not going to go too far over, but what I can do is I've got five project-based learning activities that you guys can take. And, um, you know, to Mary's question, these are things that you can scale up, you can scale down, you know, you can, you can spend a whole year on any one of these, or you could do them in a couple of lessons. But I wanted to give you some concrete takeaways because when I go to training- Drew, class, I just want to be clear real quick. You're going to give us five things that we can take from you right now and we can implement as the, as the Sunday school year begins. That's right. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. And when you take it, no credit, no nothing like that. This is like for the kids, for the faith. Don't like we don't need to play the like you know the game of like oh we we want to thank X and Y. Take these, adapt it. If you do something cool with it, send me an email, or hit me on Twitter, or you know say a prayer and send up message that way. And let me know like how it went. But we our learning intentions is that we could recognize the eight elements. I think from what I just saw in the small groups. I mean, not only recognize, you guys internalize these. I mean, I think we definitely achieved our first and biggest learning intention. But now what I want to do here, um, but I do like, you know, bringing that is here are a couple ideas that you can take and go. And on, on this, I'm just going to kind of share some stuff. This is my favorite one that I've done. Huge shout out to my parish for letting me do this because this one was ambitious. But I think it's a cool idea for, it's very, very scalable. Um, so I, I kind of mentioned we had our students researching our iconography and they got really into it and they got so into it with their sustained inquiry that I went to our, our priest and I was like, father, I don't know if you'd ever be willing to do this, but could we take a homily in November? And I mean, props to my priest who's just amazing and just the man I admire a lot. He said, absolutely. He's like, get kids up there. That would be great. And I brought it to the students. They said, hey, would you guys want to give the homily? Now, they did not jump on board at first. They were pretty nervous. But we said, hey, you've learned so much great stuff. And, um, and they ended up giving a, it was like a 17, 18 minute homily on the icons in our church. And I guarantee that it was like, I mean, you know, we have great, great messages every Sunday, but I know it was so memorable because it was different, right? The kids were up there and they were talking about the iconography in our church. So here's how you can do it. It takes, you know, I put four to six lessons, but again, it really depends on the scale in which you're doing this. Um, find something that the kids are passionate about. This is where you can use those driving questions. And, um, and this, this is something you can even level up. If they're really interested in a topic and you're doing this kind of exploratory learning or project-based, this could kind of be an option you could throw at them. But let's say you want to schedule it from the beginning. Of course, one of the first things you need to do is talk to the parish priest. And I really believe in like setting that date for the homily. So you kind of have a deadline you're working towards. Again, thinking about all the real world skills you build when you do this, by the way, like not just parish skills, but things that can help out the kids. I have students choose jobs and roles on this. And this is what took them from being really nervous to not being nervous is I said, hey, some of you guys can just be the project manager. Um, you know, you can just, you don't have to be up there speaking. You can just organize the moving parts. Well, I had one girl, that's me. It's like, okay, great. Um, who wants to be a speaker? I had two who were like, you tell me what to say and I'll say it. I just don't want to do the research and write. It's like, no problem. I'd have done the same thing. Um, we had people who were researching, people who were writing, people who, uh, we had one student, one student who um, is, on the, is on the spectrum, which means that it's a student who's autistic, who has autism, and he's amazing and came to class every Sunday, and his job was, he was our recorder, and he did a fantastic job with this, where like he, his whole job was he had the iPad, he was not comfortable being up there speaking, but he still had a job where like he recorded it, and it was the most meticulous, like perfect video taken with an iPad that I've ever seen. I guided students through the research, but really like what we did here is, um, I said that they, they had to do the research and even come up with an outline and they didn't even get finally approved to do their homily until they pitched the idea. This allowed for critique and revision. This allowed for reflection. It allowed them to like, you never want the public product to be the first time this has gone out. If that happens, it's usually like a pretty bad public product. But in this case, they had first they had to pitch the idea to our youth director and our priest. And then uh, we had people coach. I had Christina Acolino, who's on this call, who's an elementary teacher, who's fantastic. She came in and coached our students up as they gave the sermon. So by the time they gave the homily, it was really like their third or fourth time doing it. And they had all these notes. 
it is really powerful. And you could do it on any topic. Icons were great because it was really engaging for our students because we're doing an iconography campaign, but you could do, you know, what are different religions? Like, you know, explain the marriage service, what's going on behind the altar. Um, during the service, but uh, a homily, it was really powerful. I know these students won't forget it. And this is, I was struggling with attendance. I was kind of in a down year where I just didn't have as many kids. And then suddenly I had nine kids show up on a Wednesday to do research and they set the time for when they did it. And they came to church to get into the sanctuary on their own to do research. And because we put the power in their hands, that was, this is one of, that was one of my favorites. This is one of my second favorites, and I wanted to do this one even more. I haven't done it in years, but this is where uh, you have your kids. You know those wedding programs that like every newlywed couple is trying to find, and what do they do? They end up like going on Orthodox Pinterest or something to find one. Well, we had a group, we had a married couple come in. Actually, we did it for baptism, and it wasn't a married couple. It was me and my wife, but it would be even better if you did it where you have a married couple come into the class and say, Hey, could you guys help us write our re wedding program? You have real people. What's your challenging question? What should be included in an Orthodox wedding program? Is it authentic? Yeah. There's a couple from church. Like maybe it's somebody's sister or, you know, someone who's teaching dance or something. And then you have your students research and write this booklet for the couple right? It's service-based. They're learning about the sacraments. They have to do the research. You can also send it to a priest, to a youth director, to, you know, another Sunday school teacher to get feedback. And be like, hey, when you wrote this, you know, like, don't forget about the dance of Isaiah. Like, you need to emphasize that more or whatever. You could do this for any sort of sacraments, um, I could really see doing this, like, for, like, welcoming documents, you know, like, maybe this is what, you know, when somebody's new to the church, the kids could create a program for what, what's happening during the liturgy that's, like, a one-pager, but have your students create something that's actually in the church. It's usually not a bit a big ask to say, like, hey, can we keep a couple of these in the narthex for people want to know more about the liturgy, or hey, can we give this to our priests so when a new couple is baptizing their child and they want to have, like, a little pew insert, you know, during the baptism, my Sunday school class wrote it. Cool thing about these two as well, for high school students, for the baptism program, oh, sorry, I'm bouncing around, and the student-led homily, these are things that kids can talk about on resumes, they can talk about for college interviews, like it gives them something they can actually talk about uh, of like some real, some true experience, especially the homily. I had one student write their senior essay about giving a homily in church. A third one, on here is is going through and doing field trips, but not you set it up, have your kids set up these field trips. This one, you know, is going to, you can't have like, you can certainly take an eight-year-old on a field trip. You can't have them like calling up, you know, a synagogue and say like, we'd like to visit. But for 11th and 12th graders, I would totally have the 11th and 12th graders do all the logistic work because they need to learn that because we want them to be able to do that in their twenties when they're coming back to our parish. Um, so I have them create, and you guys can click on this. It's called a KWL chart. My teachers in here will know what it is. The KWL chart is basically just a chart where it's like three columns. Write down what you know and what you want to know. And then as you learn things from the want to know, you move it over into the learn column. And so you can have this up in your classroom. I have it up on my whiteboard, just in my religious ed classroom. But I would start with a KWL chart about what do you know and what do you want to know about like what faith communities are near us. Is there a synagogue near us? Is there a Hindu temple near us? Is there a Presbyterian church? Is there a Catholic church? Um, and so you write down what they know, what they wanna know. And then what you can do is propose field trips where you go see these. This takes a little bit of work with the parents, especially if you need to go on Sundays, um, but organizing field trips, I guarantee this is super authentic because they're there, but not just doing the field trip, right? If we keep that eight, project-based learning materials and, you know, uh, elements in mind, we think, oh man, okay, like we also need to let them reflect. Oh, we need to give them, you know, some time to revise and what they do. So maybe you could have them interview other young people or leaders when they go in the visit. And then also they can, after it, make sure they have time to reflect. Okay, we just went to a Catholic church. Reflect. How is this different than our church? And then one of the things you could even do at the end is give a sort of presentation, right? Because we need that public product of work. See how I'm using those eight elements to like remind myself to do more in-depth lesson design and then have them present what they learn. Don't just go on these field trips, but reflect on it and then present what they learn. Maybe they present it to their parents. Maybe it's just the priest. 
maybe they invite the people from the community. Maybe you visited three churches and you invite those youth groups over to your church and they say, hey, we went to all of y'all's churches and this is what we learned about it. And it can be really powerful. This works great with Goya too. Like it's, it can easily be a great Goya activity. I guarantee 20 years later, they'll remember this. This one I'm doing this year. So Dean, if you're on here, like this is, I'm, I'm doing this one. I can't wait. Um, and actually... I need to shout out because this is the one I, I got the uh, Stephanie had the really good idea. So Stephanie, if you're all right with it, you can give me a thumbs up if you'd be OK chiming in with like that, that one little extra addition on here. Would you be OK with that? OK, awesome. I'll have you unmute in a second. So I'll go through this, but I'll say Stephanie, give me a really cool idea on here. So. This, right, we've got coffee hours. Hopefully we can get those back going. I don't know what they look like in your parishes, ours right now. We really can't do it, but we're, you know, when coffee hours are happening or it could be at any event. You guys know how like there are science fairs, right? Well, a great example of a, um, of a way to do easy PBL is to have students research saints and do a saint fair. So maybe they research their patron saint, maybe they research a saint, you know, maybe they're from Kefalonia, so they're going to research, you know, Ayes or, you know, maybe there's, maybe they're Serbian and they're going to, um, you know, talk about their Slava or something like that. What you could do here is have them um, do research. Now, what I think would give it a really good driving question is you could create a survey and have them ask their parents or ask, maybe you ask like Philophicus or like if you're in a HEPA or something like that, hey, would you guys fill out the survey and find out how much saints, uh, how much people in the parish know about saints that would give your kids like, you know, some information like, wow, you know, our parish actually doesn't know a lot about our patron saint. There's like kind of a driving question, something that's authentic, but have them create science fair style posters and during a coffee hour, have parishioners walk around. They can talk to your class. They can look at these posters um, and talk to students and see what they learn. Now, remember, reflection is really important. So make sure your kids either have like a paper survey or a digital survey where it's like, you know, hey, did you learn about the saints? Did you learn more? And then that next class, you can do a whole reflection of like, hey, we did our saints fair, yay. But then also, you know, reflect on it. Also remember, like for my high schoolers, I would have them organize it. Like I'd have my high schools call the church office to set it up, to pick the day and to maybe even talk about like, how do we get food at these things? Because it doesn't just magically show up. If we want people to be involved in the parish life when they're 40, we need to teach them when they're 14. So, you know, teach them how to set up a coffee hour. You could also do. Um, but I was hoping um, we could have like the quick... Um, uh, Stephanie had a really cool saying when we were there and Stephanie, I was like, this is where I was kind of thinking. So do you mind sharing what you saw in the middle school and maybe how we could add that in here as well to make it even like more flashy than just a poster board, Stephanie? I may have to ask to unmute you. Okay, yeah, perfect. You're good now. Okay, so we do oh, oh, Stephanie, you mean... Stephanie, you got muted. Yeah, you got muted, sorry. Can that you hear me now? Good. Yeah, you're yeah, good. We got you. Okay. So we did um, a project in middle school, um, kind of like the Saints. I don't recall exactly what it was, but the cool thing about it was a lot of students do not like to uh, speak in person. So we had them record their voice. And then we put one of those, what did you call it, Drew? It's a QR? It's a QR code, yeah. And if you don't know what that is, it's okay. Your students will. It's like a little thing you can scan on your phone that will immediately create like a link to something. So their voices were recorded. And as, as the um, spectators or the participants walked around, they would scan it with their phone and they could hear the student's voice explaining the project. It was, it just was really neat. And it incorporated technology that the kids loved. So you could easily add that onto this project, I think. Absolutely. And so this is, it's, um, I'm so glad Stephanie brought it up because we're seeing this in school a lot. It's called a living museum. And like, it's very mm -hmm. popular in like middle school history classes. It's cool hearing people from like different parts of the country because my teachers love doing this in middle school. It's really cool. So the kids, you know, you could have them, they could, talk about the lives of the saints you could have one poster board and, and the great thing is even if you had parishioners who are not super tech savvy if you have a phone that can take a picture 
all they have to do with the QR code is flash it up and something will show up on their phone. So that could be a really cool way to, you know, and it, it could be on iography. It could be on um, feast days. There's so many different things you could do, but it's like really just doing that public product of work in a time where you have a captive audience, which is like a church coffee hour. Um, and then what are the skills that this builds up? This is teaching our kids to talk to other people about our faith. And also we're talking about, youth religious ed, but we know how lacking adult religious ed is. There's a huge chance that the parish would learn a ton from these kids too. So it could really just be this really cool perpetuating cycle. This is also a really cool thing that if you're struggling with um, attendance, right, getting some of these things out there where you're showing the community what the learning is like, and then bringing them into your classroom, it can really help people like show up more often. And so, and then the final one that I have on here is reciprocal teaching. Reciprocal teaching is, um, in, in terms of research, this is one of the most powerful ways um, to, to deal with uh, what we call knowledge transfer, basically kids learning stuff. And you've probably heard this, right? One of the best ways to learn how to do something is to teach it to others. Well, research actually totally backs that up. This one is so easy. I really like it. And you can do it. You could do this with fifth graders to second graders. You could do this with some like second graders to a pre-K class, or you could easily do it with 11th and 12th graders for elementary. And what you would do in here is actually have a teacher from a younger grade come in and talk about either something that they can't get their kids engaged in. One of the ones I would have probably do is like, I would probably have, if I'm teaching 11th grade, I'd have a fourth grade teacher come in and say, my students are too nervous to sing the hymns. You know, whether that's true or not, I'd have them like come in and say that. And then I, my challenge to my classroom would be, okay, how do we teach these kids not to be afraid of the hymns? How do we teach the next generation how to be Orthodox Christians is a great driving question. And then um, you would have your students create a lesson and go teach a lesson to a younger grade. The resources you could build in is you could have the kids make a plan. You probably have teachers in your parish or at least people who have friends or you know family who are teachers in the parish and even have them come in or your youth worker and talk about what makes a good lesson plan. How are they gonna teach hymnography or whatever they wanna teach to these kids? And then have your kids actually go in and teach the lesson. And then don't forget that reflection piece after this, right? After they teach the lesson, do an entire class where they're reflecting on what they taught and what they learned. So these are five really quick uh, things that you can take. You'll also see that like, I didn't even talk about, you know, helping the needy in your community. I mean, you could do service projects, things like Habitat for Humanity, things like doing like midnight runs for food. There's so many great examples, but these are ones I felt like you could get up and going pretty quickly. Student-led homily, creating programs for like wedding, baptism, sacraments, doing faith-based field trips, doing a saint's fair coffee hour and reciprocal teaching where you actually have your students um, create lessons for another one, uh, for, for another class. And these are really easy to do and you can basically achieve them in almost any, you know, in any context, just scale it up or down. One of my favorites, one of the ones I really wanted to put on here that I'm gonna do this year, we had to cancel with COVID is I have my students creating we got our priests to do on board. We don't do like a blessing of the waters in Richmond, like where we actually like throw the cross in a body of water. We used to. And my students, they had never seen theophany where, you know, for, or for epiphany where you throw the cross in the body of water. So my students were actually working with our priests to like set that up. And we were actually going to like plan a community event, but they had to learn about that, like what actually happens during the service. Um, but we just like, obviously we couldn't do it. And that was going to be my 2021 project. So you've got all these ideas. Um, what we would like to do now is I'd really just like to kind of bring us home and um, I'm going to kind of adapt the lesson in here and do a three, two, one, a three, two, one protocol. I'll use a lot again, if I like kind of want to wrap something up and have us reflect in the three, two, one protocol are what are three things you learned two, things you want to explore and your one big takeaway. I'm typing this in the chat right now so you can check it out. And here's the three, two, one. What are three things you learned, two things you want to explore, and your one big takeaway? Take a moment and write in the chat. Feel free to take like a minute or two on here, right? Like before you hit send. There's three things you learned, two things you want to kind of keep exploring, 
in your one big takeaway as we kind of reflect on our own progress here now that we've learned about PBL and then we've got some examples of what maybe you could do in your parish. Shoot, why does this keep work doing this to me? All right, so now that you kind of thought about it, you have some time to type in. If you're comfortable with it, go ahead and send it in. Send it in here with your reflection, three things you learn, two things you want to explore, and your one big takeaway. You can type it right here on the chat. If you want your answer to be um, anonymous, you can send it directly to me and I can post it for everybody as well. Thanks, Mary, that's awesome. Project-based learning, totally appropriate. Good for different learning, asking for feedback. What do we learn today? Absolutely, a huge thing. Just that one, getting used to that one question right at the end. Yeah, I love that, Maria. It's like one of the big things is we start to do like adult ed. I like the aggregate. That's a that's a fancier word. English teacher. Sorry, I typed all three. I thought we were supposed to. <laughs> no, you can't. That's exactly right. Okay, so type, type in whatever. We're we're wrapping this up. This is the time. To, the big thing is that we're reflecting, right? This is the, this is less about like responding and more that like we're taking time to think on our own. Um, Andrew, yeah, student led lesson is more engaging. Yeah. Oh, here, Andrew, I'm gonna put yours in. Thank you. Yeah, this one is sent. Maybe it's supposed to be anonymous. Sorry, Andrea. No problem. I accidentally sent it to you, not the group. No, hey, don't even worry. Beep, boop, got it. I know, Gina, that one big takeaway, I, I had that moment, like it was like five years ago. I was like, why am I not using best practice in my own religious education classroom? Like if I had observed the way I taught Sunday school and that's how I taught in my day job, I would have been upset with myself. You know, what's funny. I've been a teacher for 11 years and I've been a religious education director for almost as long. And yet all of the things that I know as an educator, I don't always remember to give to the teachers that I'm supposed to be leading. So got to remember to do that. <laughs> yes. Oh, guys, these are great. Um, and I want to, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, let's, we can kind of keep putting this in here and you guys can keep reading, but again, I'm going to keep us um, going. I know we started late, but I don't want to keep us like that much past when we did. I'm usually a, kind of like an animal about not going over, but I did want to make sure we had time to reflect. Um, so kind of final thoughts on this, this can be the first step of a journey. There's so many resources on here and PBL is not that like, again, like I said, it's not the end all and be all. It is the, um, it's just the, the big thing is just being kind of thoughtful up front and thinking about, thinking about doing religious education a little bit differently and giving the power to our learners and letting them be at the center of what we're doing. Um, it's, it is so easy to get up in front of a group of kids because they're generally pretty nice kids and you've got some connection with them and they're going to sit there and they're going to listen to you. But are they learning? And do you know they're learning? And so what are some strategies you can do? If you're interested in PBL, there's like so many resources. A quick Google search can find you plenty of strategies or talk to just some professional educators in your community um, who are doing this or um, 
or talk to your youth directors. There's lots of resources, but the big thought is, you know, the fact that you guys are here and you're thinking is I think a huge testament to the beauty of our faith and how much we love it and how much it means to us and how we want to pass it down and, and being a little bit more strategic and thoughtful is just going to make that easier. Um, so thank you all for your time. Um, I'm going to send a feedback survey. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat. My email is on this presentation. You guys can have this presentation. You can use any of these lessons. I'm on Twitter like a lot. Uh, if you don't, if you do Twitter, it's cool. If not, it's no big deal. Educators were typically on there, like probably too much. Um, and then, uh, but you feel free to email if you have any questions. And one of the things that we will do in this, um, in, in the feedback surveys, if you would like to do more of this, if you'd like the chance to really create one of these and get feedback, we're happy to reschedule like a meeting, like a one hour meeting a month from now, where we can even just do small groups. And I'll just get some people to like, where you can kind of come in, share your project, get some feedback on your project, let us know how things are going. If today was good too, that's fine as well. Or if you're watching kind of on the recording, thank you guys. Um, so I'm going to wrap us up on that, but I am going to um, put our feedback survey in the chat a couple of times. And now I'll pass it off to Father Chris and Father Gary. I want to thank you all so much for this opportunity. Thanks everybody for like your attentiveness and like your passion. And also like huge, huge thanks, Maria. Thank you for letting me bounce all these ideas off you and being like a huge part of this and monitoring the chat and just like being the person where I could like, like, hey, would this be a good idea? And always so supportive. So appreciate all of y'all. Father Chris, Father Gary, y'all show. I'm just going to put this in the chat now. Thank you, Drew. And I mean, speak on behalf of everybody here and everybody who's going to be listening. We have a lot of people that are asking for the recordings just because of the time difference. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Honestly, this is a, a labor of love and we can see uh, the fruits of your labor. Uh, and this is something that I think, I mean, I don't know, for me, it's always so beautiful to learn the why and then the how, but then to actually get um, applicable ministry, uh, you know, uses that you just offered us that uh, uh, just tremendous. So on behalf of my community, the metropolis, everybody here present, everybody who's going to be listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Maria as well for helping out in the preparation and for uh, facilitating and um, everybody else here. Uh, Father Gary, I'll turn it over to you for some, uh, any closing thoughts and, uh, and a closing prayer as well. We give thanks to God. Uh, Father Chris, I, I really want to thank you for collaborating and uh, Drew, um, Dr. Drew, sorry, uh, amazing presentation, really appreciate it. Um, I hope that uh, everybody's three, two, and one was great, and I look forward to doing more things like this and collaborating in the future um, as well. Thank you all for being here. God bless the work that you do and the, and the kids and the people that you inspire and that you teach. Uh, so important these days, uh, the relationships that we make and the work that we do. So keep your head up. Keep working hard and know that uh, I can speak for Drew and Father Chris and every clergyman and every Sunday school director and teacher here. Please don't ever be afraid to reach out and uh, ask questions by email or um, any other form of communication to um, collaborate and do the work that we need to do. So again, thank you very much. Um, Father Chris, uh, Dr. Drew, any, anything else you wanna say before we close with a prayer? No, really. I mean, just it, happy to, you guys made it really easy. So it's nice when a metropolis, like you guys have it set up, we can just kind of come in and do our thing. So yeah, y'all feel free to fill out that survey. It's anonymous, but let us know like what we could do. I, I do think we probably will have like a little bit of a demand to maybe do this in some other context. So if you're like, oh, this was good, but you should add this, like feel free. And the, the, like, we love feedback. It's really important. But then also if there are more strategies or things you guys would want, or if like, like sending a loom video once a month about like, here's like three teaching strategies you could do. All that stuff's really easy to do. And a lot of us do that like full time. So if there's any resources that we could do that might help kids somewhere learn about the faith, let us know. All right. Thank you. Uh, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Yes, mercy. Oh, Christ our God, who at all times and every hour in heaven and on earth, are worshiped and glorified, who are long-suffering, merciful, and compassionate, who loves the just and shows mercy upon the sinner, who calls all to salvation through the promise of blessings to come. O oh Lord, in this hour, receive our supplications and direct our lives according to your commandments. Sanctify our souls, hallow our bodies, correct our thoughts, cleanse our minds, deliver us from all tribulation, evil, and distress. 
encompass us with thy holy angels, the guided and guarded by them, we may attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of thine unapproachable glory. For thou art blessed unto the ages of ages. Amen. 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 Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. And thank you again. Thank you, Andrew. Good night. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Bye, Kubara. Good night. It was nice to see you. Good night. You just call Good people night. that, or are they really your Gumbadi? Yeah, Andrea. Andrea <laughs> baptized. Yeah. Andrea baptized Bye, Demetrius. Girls. Oh, hey, Bye, wife. Kelly. <laughs> <Andrea. laughs> I, I got the beginning and I got the end, and it was go. absolutely perfect. Thank you, Drew. Hey, tell them kids, hey. How are the hey. kids' first days of school? Oh, good. The only thing is, it picks up Dimitri today, and his teacher goes, he's still learning. And I wanted to be like, oh, you know, the 24 hours of pre K, if you want to, wasn't enough. You have to, you have to come back. He needs, so needs project based learning. <laughs> he needs it. <sighs> no, it was cute. Tell no, they're doing great. He's excited to see them soon. Oh, yeah. man. We're ready. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> awesome looking good I'm just hanging around if anybody need anything father um it looks like already i'm looking right now probably people interested in a follow-up which is no yeah. th that'd be no problem at all i, I was going to say the same thing I, I, you you covered a lot of great information quickly and um yep I, 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 the five takeaways, people come on these things, I think, because they want to take something with them. And you, you nailed that. You gave that to them. Great. Um, I have a, I have a favor to ask of you, if Father Chris is still listening and Maria as well. Uh, I'm going to start doing a radio show in September, a podcast on youth ministry uh, topics and things like that. I'd love to make this a theme for one of the, um, one of the shows. So we'll, we'll discuss that and I'll get you on my calendar. Um, it's going to be this, this format uh, on zoom, but, but you, 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 I, I love this stuff. I love, I love getting into the classroom and, and, um, getting the information to the kids and, uh, inspiring, um, the teachers to do what they have to do. So it, it's great stuff. Great stuff. I was really impressed at all the number of resources that people use that are, that are not necessarily from the archdiocese. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, as a as a priest early on in uh, you know in, in my uh, I don't want to call it a career but it, we might I, want to stop recording by the way. <laughs>